If you were to see it in the skies today, you might start wondering how you missed out on a nearby air show. You might chuckle at its quaint droning buzz as it putters its way through the air, or might take a moment to reflect on how far aviation has come. But if you were looking at the Sopwith Camel flying above you just a little bit over a hundred years ago, you'd have been looking at the greatest and most formidable warbird in the world. Armed with its twin machine guns and the proud owner of nearly 1,300 air-to-air -air kills in its lifetime, the Sopwith Camel was an icon of the biplane age. And today, Let's learn all about it. The story of the Sopwith Camel starts with its predecessor, the Sopwith Pup. Built by Sopwith Aviation Company, a British company that had only been founded just a few years prior, the Pup entered service in October 1916, just as the air battles of World War I were really starting to evolve into proper dogfights. The Pup was a popular plane in its day, highly maneuverable and generally an enjoyable experience to fly, and when it first came onto the scene, it quickly outclassed the early model biplanes that had been dominating the first years of the war. But just as quickly as the pup eclipsed its predecessors, so too was it also eclipsed by a new generation of German planes. In less than eight months after it was first introduced to the battlefield, the pup, all 1800-ish planes that have been built, was obsolete. The period that came immediately afterward was known as Bloody April, a short but vicious few weeks in which pups and other Allied aircraft were brutalized by newer German fighters with little ability to fight back. If it had continued unabated, the British government may have been forced to concede the air war outright rather than risk sending more pups into the air to have their pilots inevitably slaughtered. But luckily for the Allied war effort, Sopwith Aviation already had a successor craft in their back pocket, one that had been taking test flights and receiving its final modifications even while the pup was still in its heyday. The camel was the brainchild of Sopwith's chief engineer Herbert Smith, who had also taken charge for design of the pup, but understood the earlier plane's clear drawbacks. His follow-on design, then simply known as the Big Pup, would have to bring significantly greater firepower to bear with better engines and maneuverability, and in the early days of fighter aircraft, these sorts of improvements would have to be paid for with sacrifices elsewhere. These new planes simply couldn't be designed with the same kind of pleasant, easygoing pilot experience in mind. The war was moving too fast, and for the first time in a long and storied history of aviation engineering, performance would have to take precedence above all else. Like the other planes of its time, Herbert Smith's Big Pup was built mostly of wood, with a central box for its fuselage that relied on plywood as its base component. This plywood was then reinforced with wire bracing to give it as much structure as possible, and in front of the pilots, the engine was guarded by an aluminium cowling. The rest of the plane was built of a fragile, largely unprotected wooden frame with fabric stretched tight across the wings and tail. The cockpit was streamlined and efficient, with all of its controls squeezed into a small section at the front of the plane where the pilot, engine, and weaponry would also sit in order to make the plane more aerodynamic than its predecessors. Although this sort of aircraft design is one that we might dismiss as a death trap, today, the Big Pup was actually built to be a little bit bulkier and more durable than the original Pup had been, as well as more maneuverable, and even though the wooden canvas were prone to catching on fire and burning the entire plane down, well, that sort of came with the territory if you were a World War I fighter pilot. The Big Pup used a rotary engine, usually made by either the Clergate or Bentley companies, that generated a bit over 100 horsepower. Much akin to the biplanes that they were attached to, these engines were in the middle of their own rapid evolution. They'd only become practical to use in flight about seven years prior to the Big Pup's first test flight, and the Big Pup was one of the first planes to integrate an engine specifically built for aircraft. Earlier engines just had been bolted onto an aircraft despite being designed for cars, and their weight and lack of reliability had been a bit of a drag on aircraft performance. But rotary engines were built with the specific intent of generating the most possible horsepower at the lightest possible weight. The engines used in the Big Pup also included another major evolution. They used airflow to cool themselves even when the aircraft was stopped because of the air being sucked by the propeller through the exposed sections of the engine itself. Then there was the armament, which posed a problem for Sopwith because the plane would have to include multiple machine guns in order to compete with German aircraft. The Big Pup included dual machine guns mounted directly ahead of the cockpit, firing cleanly into the pilot's line of sight, but this meant that now two machine guns, not just one, would have to be coordinated to fire in synchronicity through the blades of the propeller. Sopworth was able to create Britain's first synchronizer capable of handling two weapons, and as time went on, they replaced the synchronizer with a hydraulic system that 
that worked even better. The plane's armament also ensured that the big pup would stand out in another way, its hump-shaped cover over the machine guns, which earned it the nickname Camel from its pilots. Although it would never be referred to by such an official capacity, the name stuck. Here is a stop with Camel, an English fighter plane which was one of the deadliest opponents in World War I. The plane would have its first test flight on the 22nd of December 1916, piloted by Harry Hawker, who would later go on to co-found Hawker Aircraft. Before long, the Camel had proven to the British War Office that it was the successor craft that the UK needed in order to stand any chance in the war. In May 1917, the War Office requested its first batch of 250 planes. Over the course of 1917, well over 1,300 would be produced, and by the time production concluded on the plane, there were almost 5,500 of the craft serving in Britain, as well as its partners, around the world. Upon its entry into service, the Sopwith Camel was a formidable aircraft when compared to the standard of the day. A one-seater aircraft with an overall length of 18 feet 9 inches, the Camel had a wingspan of 28 feet exactly and a biplane arrangement that was the World War I standard. When it sat empty, the plane weighed less than half a ton, 930 pounds, a number only achievable because of the wood and fabric design we mentioned earlier. The plane sat at a height of 8 feet 6 inches and its maximum weight was just under 1,500 pounds, and all things considered, it wasn't really much larger than a heavy duty pickup truck. Camel flew at a maximum speed of just 113 miles per hour, but at the time you could refer to that as bloody quick. Its stall speed was just 48 miles an hour, and it had a range of 300 miles and a service ceiling of 90,000 feet, which it reached at a climb rate of 1,085 feet per minute. It was armed with two 7.7mm Vickers machine guns, and it could be fitted with up to four 20-pound bombs for ground attack purposes. Now, all of these figures were impressive for the Camel's time, but where it really excelled was its engine power and agility. When flown properly, the Camel could outperform just about any of the planes that had come before it. When it entered service with the British military, the Camel was, on paper, the best thing the Brits had in the skies. But its pilots, well, they told a different story. In the aftermath of bloody April, and after multiple years of grueling aerial combat, many of the RAF's experienced pilots had gone down with their pups and other aircraft before the Camel widely became available. That meant the Camel was essentially being handed out to new pilots, since even if they weren't complete amateurs, they were unlikely to be able to fully understand what the Camel was capable of or what it required of its pilots. See, when we mentioned earlier that Sopwith had traded off easy piloting experience in exchange for better performance, we absolutely meant it. Over the Camel's lifetime, more pilots would die trying to learn how to fly it than would die in active aerial combat, a problem so bad that a young, inexperienced pilot's life expectancy in the cockpit was barely over two weeks. This was largely due to how weight and inertia were distributed through the aircraft. The Camel's rotary engines caused a so-called gyroscopic effect, where the presence of such a large rotating mass in the front of the plane caused it to swerve from side to side and change its attitude, that's its orientation relative to the horizon of the Earth. When the plane turned sharply in flight, it would end up with its nose pointed up or down more than a pilot would have wanted, and as a result, the pilots had a tendency to overreact and lose control. As Lieutenant Colonel L.A. Strange, a flight instructor at the time, described, young Camel pilots pilots spun out at alarming rates during their first solo flights, requiring the plane to have to be significantly modified by airfield engineers in order to introduce trailer models where the flight instructor could join their student or take control if need be. Even after the problem of immediate spin-outs had been addressed, though, pilots were forced to compensate for the Camel's strange tendencies. The torque of the engine made it very slow when making left turns, so many pilots cut corners by necessity, turning 270 degrees to the right instead of 90 degrees to the left. The planes spun out almost as soon as they stalled, and because of how heavy the fuel load in the Camel's tail was, pilots had to fly it continually pushing the stick forward. The Camel's fuel efficiency, too, was nothing to write home about. The plane guzzled fuel and dripped oil constantly. It would dive when it took those hard right turns and climb any time it was expected to go left, and any changes in weight to the aircraft would change yet again the way that it flew. But if a pilot could gain fluency on the Camel, for a plane that seemed so desperately keen on turning right all the time, well, it was really good at turning right, and its design afforded it a number of other aerodynamic edges over the competition, mostly owing to how tightly packed the controls, pilot, engine, and armament were into a single point of balance near the front of the aircraft. Its turning radius was tight enough that it was all but guaranteed to gain favorable angles on the enemy during dogfights, and at its best, the Camel was nothing short of acrobatic. 
As author Robert Jackson put it, in the hands of a novice, it displayed vicious characteristics that could make it a killer. But under the firm touch of a skilled pilot who knew how to turn its vices to his own advantage, it was one of the most superb fighting machines ever built. The Camel flew with the number four squadron of the Royal Naval Air Service, where it quickly proved just how badly it could outclass German fighters. Before long, the Camel would be flying in over 50 fighter squadrons. It was by the Camel's intervention that the aerial battles of World War I went from one-sided to closely contested, then one-sided in the other direction, where the Allies would maintain air superiority through the end of the year and deep into 1918. Before long, the Camel became a valuable export product for Britain's allies, most prominently Canada, who made extensive use of the plane in their own air force. Australia, Belgium, the United States also operated Camels in large numbers, and nations from Greece to the Netherlands to Georgia to the Soviet Union all made sure to have at least a few of the planes in their arsenal. The planes were adapted to include a number of different engines, and some were fitted out with Lewis guns which could fire incendiary ammunition that could bring down German Zeppelins. The Camel was also adapted into a night fighter, and it was used for experimentation in developing ground attack aircraft which used their machine guns for strafing and integrated more resilient armor plating. Given its ubiquity on the Western Front, it should be no surprise that a number of aces made their name behind the controls of the Camel. William Lancelot Joran, a South African serving with the British Royal Air Force, claimed 39 air-to-air -air victories and earned numerous combat decorations. Major John Inglis Gilmore, a Scotsman, claimed his own set of 39 air-to-air -air kills, including five on one day in July 1918. Englishman Henry Winslow Woollett of Suffolk claimed 35 air-to-air -air victories, including six in just a single day, and Australian pilot Harry Cobby led his nation's aces with 29 victories. But it was the Camel's Canadian aces who stood out above the rest, led by William Barker, who shot down 46 enemy planes behind the stick of just one aircraft, his Camel number B6313, which is remembered today as the most successful single fighter aircraft in Royal Air Force history. Cementing his legacy even more, Barker never lost a single wingman on his missions and never allowed a single aircraft under his escort to be shot down. If you've got a time machine and happen to be a World War I combat pilot, do make friends with Billy Barker. Two other Canadians made themselves famous in the Camel, Donald McLaren, with most of his 54 air-to-air -air kills coming during his time in the Camel, and Roy Brown, who shot down and defeated the notorious Red Baron. The Camel also played an outsized role in intercepting and defeating German bombing raids, where they were especially adept at shooting down more durable heavy bombers, and when those bombing squadrons switched into night attacks, the Camels were able to follow, with seven Camel squadrons proving more than capable of keeping overwatch on the British Heim Islands. They were also integrated as attack craft for both naval ships and airships on the high seas. The Camel was adapted to launch from turrets of warships, and it was welcomed as a centerpiece on some of the world's first aircraft carriers. They were also used in experimental testing as a parasite fighter hanging off an airship. This tactic wouldn't ever be adopted at a large scale, but that certainly wasn't the fault of the Camels. Of course, the rapid pace of fighter development in World War I didn't simply stop when the Camel entered service, and by the tail end of the war, the Camel II had been outmatched by fighters like the Fokker D7 in terms of climb rate and high altitude performance. However, it wasn't so outdated to be useless, and the Camel ended up proving highly adaptable to ground attack roles at the perfect time to be used in force during the collapse of Germany's front lines. Using 25-pound bombs and strafing machine gun fire, the Camel was able to inflict heavy losses on German troops, although low-altitude strafing runs also brought pilots in range of direct fire from ground forces. The Camel was instrumental in putting a stop to Germany's last great offensive push in the spring of 1918, where their strafing fire caused chaos on the German side. Here, the Camels conceded air-to-air -air fighter duties to other aircraft that could perform better at high altitude, and as a result, they were afforded nearly complete protection from enemy fighters who couldn't risk attacking the Camels without establishing dominance at altitude. As such, the Camel was one half of the Allied effort to maintain air superiority in the last months of the war, which they did seamlessly and with great effect. At the end of 1918, World War I finally came to a close, but the Camel's mission didn't stop there. After the Great War concluded, the Camel would see further action above Russia during an Allied intervention in the Russian Civil War. There, the Camel continued its ground attack role, bombing Bolshevik bases and helping to lock down the Caspian Sea. They proved to be adept at hit-and-run tactics and were able to intensely harass Communist forces. But eventually, the balance of the Civil War became too much for the Allied intervention. The RAF was forced to withdraw, and any Camels that they had to leave on the ground were destroyed in order to keep them out of Bolshevik hands. 
And it was the conclusion of the war effort that ended up being the conclusion of the camel's time in service. By 1920, the plane would be phased out, and when the next war came, it was far too outdated to be considered even a tiny bit useful. But the camel has lived on since then as a pop culture icon in books, movies, and other stories recalling the Allied air war during World War I. It makes good sense, after all. The Allied war effort cannot be understood without the camel. It was simply too impactful to leave out, and when compared to the other planes of the war, the Sopwith camel isn't just remembered as a valued team player, it's remembered as the MVP, the most successful aircraft of the entire war. Just a small handful of camels survive today in museums and private collections in the nations where they were used, but the legacy of the camel is all but guaranteed to endure, even after the final surviving aircraft is inevitably lost to history.